listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. The United States government has engaged in a proxy war with Russia, a scaling Bitcoin conference without the mention of block size increase, one coin as a scam, and much more here on episode 177, Wednesday, October 12, 2016. JJ, in the traditional markets, we have gold trading at $1,254.90. We have silver trading at $17.45. Oil uh, is currently at $50.01 a barrel, uh, while the Dow is at 18,144 points. Uh, and the 30 year Treasury is yielding a, t- a rate of 2.498%. In the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin trading at $635, Litecoin trading at $3.78. Ethereum is trading at $11.66. Dash is at $11.32. And Monero is trading at uh, $7.27 worth of Bitcoin. And Steam is trading at $0.28 worth of Bitcoin. And AMP is trading at $0.17.8 worth of Bitcoin. And uh, JJ, uh, it's not very surprising this week that one doge is equal to one doge. All right. Thank you, Darren. Now, just a reminder, you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. And if you don't want to miss a single moment of our uh, awesome content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and more. Visit neocashradio.com for the links to all of those things. Excellent. Thank you, Brandy. Well, getting right into the news, there's a lot to talk about, and we really want to spend some time uh, getting to the serious stuff, but we also want to promote the next week's show when we have a guest on a uh, guest interview with uh, Roger Ver. Bitcoin Jesus. That's right. So next week's show, we will definitely have a lot of questions and, and information to ask him. But if you have anything you think we should ask Roger Ver, by all means, send us an email at Darren at neocashradio.com and we will try to uh, factor that in. So yes. when we've gotten to our news, uh, we've got news out of Dubai. Uh, yeah, the Crown Prince of Dubai announced uh, a plan that will see all government documents secured on a blockchain by 2020. Um, so according to a statement, the, the government estimates that their blockchain strategy could generate 25.1 million hours of economic productivity each year in savings uh, while reducing CO2 emissions. Um, kind of, it, they didn't talk about whether it was going to be an open blockchain or anything like that, but just requiring that all government documents... Uh, are traceable this way and sort of alleviating a lot of redundancy. Um, one of the more interesting aspects is that they're going to open the platform to other cities and nations, uh, which they think could build an international network that would make it easier for people to cross borders, uh, you know, and have all sorts of sort of authenticated wallets and things like that. So we'll see if it's for evil or not, but it, it seems that there's a, a strong drive here for more more transparency and efficiency. Excellent. And, you know, Dubai definitely is one of those places that is at the forefront of a lot of technologies and a lot of innovation. There's a lot of money there that gets spent on some of these things. And, and you can see there's, sky, there's you know skyscrapers and things like that. But the blockchain, I think that is a great place for it to another incubator, if you will. Uh, moving on, we're talking about the United Nations and blockchain. So the United Nations has an alternative financing laboratory they launched last year. Among other things, the lab is looking at microfinance, remittances, and more. Of interest to us is the use of blockchain to exchange funds. Uh, In a recent blog post, uh, lab representatives wrote, when it comes to UNDP's emergency response and employment, we have a hunch that blockchain could provide a more effective way of transferring and tracking funds and shifting our strategy in line with what is happening in the field. This is a work in progress, though, but one we're excited about. Now, add into that that the United Nations Child Fund is looking for someone to head up a uh, their blockchain project. Some they they're looking for a blockchain solution to funding, and they need someone to head that up as of August. So I don't know if they found that person yet, but um, so that's the United Nations. You yeah, think? and I think it's important to talk about remittance markets. I mean, certainly we're seeing. Uh, more press about like the the failures of the American Red Cross uh, to their relief efforts in Haiti. There's an article that came out uh, saying that they'd spent a half a billion dollars on building something like six homes from the last uh, disaster. So the ability to transfer humanitarian aid where it's most needed quickly, efficiently, and inexpensively uh, is very important. And remittance payments 
Um, when JJ and I put together our, our decrypting Bitcoin video earlier in the year, we talked about remittance payments being, a, I believe, a $480 billion industry. And basically, this is money being transferred from people working in different countries back home to their families. And oftentimes, banks and uh, other money transmitters like Western Union, they can take anywhere from 9 to 16% of that um, simply for transferring funds, and it doesn't necessarily always uh, get there as planned. So it's important to look at cryptocurrency as a, as a big solution to a, a big market. Well, and accountability. Yes. There was recently, because you know Haiti's been in the news again with the, the hurricane, but there was talk of the Red Cross relief effort. And something, the headline was, with all the money donated, some millions of dollars, they only built six houses. Yeah, half and then, a billion dollars. And then the, the other story was basically that people in Haiti were like, do not donate to Red Cross. There are other means if you want to help us. Yeah. So that's, you know, news from Haiti and uh, the Red Cross. So the, the blockchain would have that sort of accountability that you need to know your funds got there and how much got there. Now, how someone spends it, well, that's another layer of accountability you kind of have to Yeah, spending on what it's earmarked for, not going into a general fund, right. you know, money laundering, legal money, money laundering. Now, we talked about, I believe we've talked about one coin at least one time below before in a previous episode. Once again, we're coming back to talk about one coin because it's still going on and the scam is still continuing. We're, we're looking at a Coin Telegraph article, article where they interview Bruce Fenton about one coin. He adds his voice to many more about how one coin is a Ponzi scheme. There's no evidence of a blockchain, a wallet, or any bit of code that one could examine. They recently had a launch event in Thailand in which 8,400 people attended. They watched a video about the company. And experts on the web have analyzed that video and the blockchain or cryptocurrency they tried to uh, demonstrate. And they say it's all faked. It's all just uh, contrived, like an animated video or something like that. In fact, a group made up of crypto developers, business people, early adopters, investors, and many more released a statement about OneCoin on GitHub. And a quote from that statement sums it up as there is no evidence that there are that there really is such a blockchain by any readable definition. So if you know someone involved in OneCoin, uh, definitely fill them in. And I don't think it's anyone in the Western. I think they're targeting people, especially in the uh, Asian areas, and counting on people to not be informed about enough about the cryptocurrency but to know what cryptocurrency is you know that's sort of the early uh the early snake oil salesman mm -hmm. using terms that people heard about but yet don't really understand well um, and i think bruce fenton's concern is that yes is so one one key uh, uh quote from bruce in the article is basically he's he's concerned because quote because when one coin collapses and thousands lose their money the regulators will blame all cryptocurrencies unquote which is a great concern to have. But I think part of, uh, part of the, the counter message or counter idea to that concern is that there has been a lot of press and a lot of people speaking out against OneCoin for months now, or at least, at least a month now, if not more. And yes, regulars might look at the, the fact that OneCoin is a scam, but at the same point, the community has been there to warn people, to advertise that this is a scam, and to proliferate that information. So it's not like the community isn't doing anything about it. The free market is doing something, and they're doing what they're, they, they can only do, right? They can only spread information and allow people to make their own choices. Yeah, and, and just for, for listeners, looking at the kind of media they're putting out to promote OneCoin, you know, these are making promises of future gains that you will double your money in a certain amount of time. Um, yeah, when you, whenever you see something like that, D run it's yeah. guaranteed returns are not a thing no so yeah and and darren and, and, and like lottery too that, that i i love that the famous uh the, the quote of of lottery is for people who don't know math or, yeah or <laughs> yeah i mean we we solved that in our if, if you have someone giving you a crazy math equation whether it's an investment or a lottery or anything you should really be skeptical but moving on scam wallets moving on yeah, we've heard of these before. Uh, they'll probably keep coming, but uh, these have been taken down already just uh, four days ago. Reddit users reported that uh, two wallet apps on the Apple Store, uh, they were called Ocean and Alpha Wallet. They were both from a publisher called Bitcoin with a space in between bit and coin. Uh, they were fraudulent and likely designed to steal Bitcoin from users' wallets. 
Um, so they've since been removed, but uh, just a reminder to only use trusted wallets from trusted sources. Uh, and we've got a good link you can use as well as a link to the basic Bitcoin security guide from Reddit. Um, if you wanted to take a look at some more best practices when securing your funds, it's a smart thing to do. Take that extra step. One side note, uh, Apple has approved Monero usage and wallets, but yet they still have not approved Dash. So if, huh. it's, if it's the security anonymity principle that they're arguing on, well, then that doesn't make sense anymore. So, yeah, so someone doesn't figure. like somebody. Uh, Darren, what do you got? Well, uh, in other news, Apple got rid of their uh, phone jack. But uh, yeah, so, the, <laughs> so this story is about the Swiss National Bank. And uh, the this, this story is saying that the, uh, the Swiss National Bank can lower interest even further. And that's news because uh, Switzerland already has a negative interest rate. It's negative 0.75. And that's the central bank rate. And... Uh, I did some math, and uh, there, that means that the half-life of money in Switzerland is about 92 years. And if they lower it any further to negative, like, 1%, the, then the half-life of money would be 68 years. And it's kind of funny to think about money having a half-life. It is, Darren. Yes. And the fact that you brought it up like that is is sort of a scary way to think about how it's literally evaporating. Yeah, it's, it's it's exponential decay. So it's it's the same thing that applies to radioactive material. So uh, so yes. So um, analysis an analyst think that the, uh, the Swiss National Bank, which has um, the most severe sub zero interest rate uh, of any major central bank, could cut in its interest rate to low as minus one point two five percent, according to recent Bloomberg survey. So. Uh, and and we've already reported that this this is passed through to retail customers. So this is the central bank l- rate, but then banks get tired of holding money that's losing money, and uh, they eventually they'll pass that cost on to the consumers at, at a retail bank. So uh, if if you're in Switzerland, it's a bad time for you to be saving. It seems like <laughs> definitely well, they're, they're they're saying that the the Swiss franc is grossly overvalued anyway and i think that that's what they've been trying to curb that's what they're saying they're trying to curb is yeah. that it's appreciation any further yeah they, they've been trying to do that for a while but they failed basically they they pegged it to the euro for a bit but they had to break that peg after three or four years because uh the people were buying the the swiss franc a little bit too much so yeah, yeah and after the peg the, the franc jumped up of course as people expected it and, and sort of stabilized but it is worth more than it was uh pegged right to the euro right so we're moving on and we're talking about uh one of the main stories here today and as always you can check out our blog at neocashradio.com for all the stories and news and uh links to sources and and more but we're talking about Syria and Syria is nothing more than a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia. The U.S. is arming and backing the rebel contingent, creating an army of paid mercenaries, in some cases with help from Saudi Arabia. Some of these rebels have joined ISIS, which is fighting right along with the rebels, giving more credit to the idea that the U.S. created ISIS, or at least funded it in the first place. These state-sponsored rebel groups have taken parts of the city of Aleppo, and airstrikes are cutting off some residents from humanitarian aid. So, J.J., what, what's your, you're saying the U.S. created ISIS? What's well, your source on that? Uh, my source, I've actually watched uh, quite a, a good uh, expose from Ben Swan, and he details the, the ISIS creation from basically the post-Iraq war uh, militants that they had worked with. And so that's where I got it. We'll have a link to it on the blog. Check it out, neocashradio.com. Uh, The Assad government is backed by Russia with outright payments and agreements to rebuild infrastructure. Russian strikes have been made against rebel groups, including those backed by the U.S., much to the dismay of U.S. military special forces caught up in the middle. So the special forces are in Syria. The U.S. is in Syria. Uh, Syria is one of the few nations left on the original axis of evil list created by U.S. warmongers. Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya have been scratched off the list, and U.S. foreign policy doesn't seem to have shifted. Russia has made it clear that they do not support regime change in Syria. Capturing Aleppo is critical to the rebel efforts in Syria. They have seemingly put all their eggs in this one basket, and if this fails, it may be several years before the next attempt can be made. This current battle for Aleppo has been ongoing since 2012. Without Russian support, U.S.-backed forces may have already taken the entire city, but it appears that Assad may have come out on top, as Russian air power has devastated rebel-held parts of the city. If this wasn't bad enough, Russia has moved more anti-aircraft batteries into the Assad-controlled Syrian region of Latakia. 
As we bring the scope back to look at the region and the world, with half of the city of Aleppo homeless, NATO commanders are claiming that Assad and Russia are weaponizing migration to destabilize other countries. The U.S. is upset with Russia meddling and has cut ties with Russia over Syria, and has named Russia as the culprit behind the DNC hack that exposed heir apparent Hillary Clinton. The Obama administration pointed the finger at Russia's senior most officials and vowed to avenge the attack in a proportional response, as if cyber war can be met out in milligrams. The barbs go back and forth with Russian President Vladimir Putin accusing the United States of escalating problems in the Middle East. Nuclear war hype has hit the airwaves as American media seeks to make the case for more violence. Russia has suspended a nuclear research agreement with the U.S. and terminated another regarding research reactors. As if to ratchet up the posturing, both the U.S. and Russia have run nuclear weapon test drills. 40 million Russians took part in various civil defense drills earlier in October. Tensions between the U.S. and Russia are worse than during the Cold War due to a lack of clear boundaries and limits. Be sure to check our blog for links to the sources we used in this report. We'll keep you posted with the news that matters. Keep your, keep your, your eye on the blog at newcashway.com and ret- retweet all the things. Excellent. 40, so, 40 million. 40 million Russians. That's right. So 40 so, million Russians did a bunch of civil defense drills. Now, this wasn't just going in bomb shelters, but there's a bunch of different drills. And, and to say 40 million, imagine that some of the drills were bring your kids and, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily 40 million soldiers training in, in boot camp. Sure. I, I think that actually, I actually do think that nuclear weapons are the greatest threat to humans. I believe so, right yes. Now. I mean, it's not an, an asteroid hitting the Earth that could happen, but the chances are low. I think the greatest threat to humans are humans. Yeah. And j- just for, uh, for, for scale, New York City has 8.4 million people living in it. So just an idea of what 40 million people might feel like. Yes. No, it's definitely a country-wide thing. And uh, in, in, keep in mind that Aleppo is roughly the hot, half the size of New York City, at least it was before this all started. Now you have half the population, 2 million people, homeless. Now that's, that's a significant portion of the population. That whole region is is completely chaotic and destabilized. So... And they wonder how people in the Middle East get radicalized. Yeah. Well, give yeah, take their home away and then drive them out with you know chlorine attacks going on. Things like that are still happening too. Yeah. And, so and I'm I'm seeing more reports that this is absolutely just a proxy war full of mercenaries that have been sent and are just basically fighting for the highest payer. They have very little allegiance. That's just that's where they found they can make money and provide for their families. It's it's a hot spot. And as I mentioned, it's been going on since 2012. This isn't new. Nothing here that's been going on here is new. It's always been a proxy war where the United States is trying to overthrow Assad, which is something they've been doing for a long, long time. They've always disliked this guy for whatever reason. He doesn't go along with their game plan. He doesn't play the way that they want him to play, I'm, I'm imagining. So they want to replace him with someone who will. I mean, that's kind of how the other regions, the other countries in the region have gone. But moving on, we've got a lot more things to talk about here, and the Scaling Bitcoin Conference is the next item. Um, Yeah, so the Scaling Bitcoin Conference took place in Milan this weekend. Uh, It's a conference for the Bitcoin development community to talk about uh, how they're going to safely scale and decentralize the Bitcoin protocol. That's what was uh, sold, but uh, there was some criticism that uh, the conference didn't actually focus on increasing block size or doing any other on-chain improvements, but instead focusing on scaling sky, uh, side chains and drive chains and other kind of sort of second which, layer overlays. Which, uh, talking about one coin, I don't believe side chains exist. That it's, it's come to think about it, I don't think there's any working implementation of a side chain. Okay. And only so, on the test net. Yes. We, we talked oh, about the Lightning there, Network on the there test is a net. Working. Okay. So yeah. they. They are working on it, but I don't think they're there yet. I think so, there's still okay. more development. So it's not as vaporware as the other stuff. Yeah, no. So in fact, they, they talked quite a bit about the Lightning Network and uh, sort of it the, it still has problems in routing uh, the payment layer um, and until seg- until Segregated Witness comes out, which is now on the test net. And they, uh, according to Blockstream, uh, it's close to being um, out on uh, deployment on the main net. So... Um, but some of the things they're looking at, Bitfury has a protocol called Flare, and there's also something, uh, Onion Routing, which would basically do the privacy preserving of the Lightning Network, um, but they would decentralize micropayments and go through a set of different Onion Routers, so it uh, you know sort of masks the transaction a little more. Um, one of the other very interesting 
propositions they were talking about was Mimble Wimble, which was this protocol proposition that was dropped in the Bitcoin forums a few months ago by an anonymous user that you know has since vanished. But uh, a mathematician at Blockstream, uh, Andrew Polstra, took a look at it. It's a proposed side side chain uh, that effectively merges all transactions in a single block and hides the amounts. Um, only the recipient and the sender see the actual amount. So this increases privacy and fungibility. And it also, uh, another one of the big points of Mimblewimble is that it decreases the amount of data that bait Bitcoin nodes have to store because it actually cancels out matching inputs and outputs over time. So it's, I guess, uh, they can have years worth of, of uh, transaction data in less than a megabyte. So it's it's well, pretty I, interesting to watch. I, I, I wonder how they get the UTXO out of that. You know what I'm saying? Without the input outputs, you know, how does the, you know, I'm sure they have a solution. I'm sure that they wouldn't come up with this without creating UTXO solution so that the the nodes can verify. But um, it's, it's great to see these, these new things. I'm glad that there isn't just the lightning network and that's all they're talking about. You know, it's the whole point of this crypto, I think is to explore a lot of different solutions and a lot. Obviously we've seen it with altcoins and, um, uh, Roger Ver will have uh, an interview with Roger Ver once again next week. Be sure to tune in for that. But uh, his, you know, his, uh, he's sort of sponsoring and throwing his support behind Bitcoin Unlimited. And, uh, you know, that's increasing the block size. Increasing the block size. That's basically the opposite of what these people are talking about. These people are talking about how do we not increase the block size and yet come up with a solution. And he, his solution is, well, just increase the block size right now. And then still, like, still keep doing what you're doing, right? We can still keep researching better solutions while increasing the block size at least to two megabytes right now. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what's going on there. We have an, and then an ICO. So there's a funny website out there, and I think we're going to try to put the link on our blog. It's called The ICO, and it kind of goes with the OneCoin um, scam idea and... Uh, and it just sort of comes up because we're talking about Augur's ICO in the next article, but... Um, yeah, if you check a out, little Easter egg. Yeah, if you check out the ICO.info, it just it's sort of a satire site making fun of uh, initial coin offerings and how they all look the same. Yeah, <laughs> they do. Uh, well, so prediction market Augur, uh, which is running on Ethereum based blockchain, um, they hosted an ICO and raised over five point three million dollars for their uh, reputation tokens, uh, the REP. So the rep tokens are also now available on exchanges like Poloniex, Bittrex, Kraken, and Shapeshift, uh, though their value has fallen. So when the ICO started on October 4th, they were starting at $13 per token, and uh, they're now down to a low of $5.51 earlier today. So what these do, uh, Augur is basically a prediction market where people can um, create bets on something that's going to happen in the future. Once these, uh, once whatever the, the, the conditions are, are met, once the time is up on the bet, once the elections happened or the football game's over or whatever, um, people with rep tokens, they're called reporters. They come in and v- verify which team won or which president, whatever, won. So they have to hold reputation tokens to do that. And now if it's found uh, that someone's reporting false information, it's not meeting up with consensus, they actually lose uh, up to 20% of their reputation tokens if their reports conflict. Wow. So it, it report it's basically... Uh, this is the way to beside if you're if you want to do something besides betting on this site, you can become a reporter, and these rep tokens are how you do that. So um, we'll we'll see how they go, and we'll see if this doesn't get uh, attempts made to shut it down, as prediction markets have been in the past because they view it as illegal gambling. But because this is decentralized, perhaps Augur will be one of them. And I know there's a couple other prediction markets out there like Gnosis and. Um, but I haven't played with them at all. I haven't played with a prediction market, but I was looking at data from prediction markets, and uh, there was one website that aggregated that data, and it's very interesting. They've got uh, very uh, strong uh, probabilities for who wins president and who wins governor in New Hampshire. Wow. I'm, I'm surprised. I thought it'd be more closer to 50 50, but it's like 60 40. And I think one was eighty twenty. It was it was kind of ridiculous. And I know it's a big interest for uh, Vitalik Buterin as well, the the founder of the Ethereum Foundation. He's very very interested in prediction markets and using yeah. those to to guide policy. Um, and yeah, his future key. Yes. Yeah, it's it's all about that. So, so going on, yeah. uh, we have some local news once again. Uh, thank you for bringing it back to New Hampshire, Darren. But uh, New Hampshire State House 
So uh, the crypto commission uh, happened, and Randy, you you were there. Yeah, so I actually went up to the uh, legislative office building up in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, because there is a uh, crypto commission that was set up last year. Um, there was a little bit of of uh, regulation that was put in place, one little bit that uh, authorized the banking department to license businesses uh, who transmit convertible virtual currency, they could uh, license and regulate them as money transmitters similar to Western Union or uh, or something like that. Um, when that was put in place, this commission was also formed, and they had a meeting um, this last Thursday, and one week before that, I attended the second meeting. Um, and when I came in, it was basically a, a, um, a representative from the banking department, someone from the securities commission, and uh, a few reps, and then there were some members of the public, including uh, Ian Freeman from Free Talk Live, and uh, just several other concerned citizens. Someone from Poloniex had been there the week before. Um, basically what it came down to was the banking, uh, representative, the banking department representative was really pushing for, for regulation as, as one would expect since there's uh, incentive for them to do so. Um, but the rest of the representatives either said that there was not enough information, uh, to tell them that they thought that anything needed to be regulated. Another representative volunteered that she didn't even begin to understand the technology enough to have any basis to make a ruling on something like this. Um, and another representative, Barbara Biggie, uh, said the regulation would snuff the cryptocurrency industry in New Hampshire and around the country and added that she thinks the government should stay out of it regulation-wise, and she will actually be sponsoring a bill to repeal the loan existing regulation uh, on Bitcoin in New Hampshire. So basically what they did last year will be will be peeled away. And uh, Representative John Hunt um, was very kind in saying that uh, you know a lot part of this was because people from the public came out to to voice their opinions um, and that you know it, that it's just too young of an industry to begin putting regulations on because it would in fact thwart it um, the banking representative also uh, referred back to the Poloniex rep who'd been there the week before and just said well he he wanted regulation and uh, rep hunt and Ian Freeman were pretty quick to remind her that he didn't say he wanted regulation he said he expected regulation uh so it's nice to see some of that going away here and uh so poloniex users got a, 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 an email from poloniex of course stating that if they're a new hampshire resident that they can no longer work with poloniex that the, the, that the funds would not be able to transfer until that this was resolved basically that they right. wouldn't be able to do business after october 6th until it was resolved and so uh, it looks like that will hopefully be resolved soon um and um well, and and definitely bringing it all back, Ian Freeman is one of the people who you know talks about this on Free Keen and uh, his other platform, Free Talk Live, I'm sure. But um, you know, he's someone who suffered from that issue because he uses Polonix, and you know, that's that's just one way in which things were running just fine. Everything was running fine. Every everyone was doing great. You know, people who wanted to exchange things with this exchange could do so, and and then all of a sudden the government comes in and says, hey. We're just going to put some regulation into effect. We don't even know what's going on. We have no idea about cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, but we're going to say this thing. And then the 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 fallout, the unseen, right, that happens when government makes legislation without actually knowing what they're doing or understanding, you know, is like these sorts of things. Luckily, it was very mild compared to a lot of other uh, situations. Yeah. Well, and Representative Hunt was who led who leads the commission was quick to say that if he knew what he if he knew what he knows now if he'd known it last year when this all went into place he would have never uh been for that legislation so um yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to watch and i hope it does get repealed quickly um because uh, local activist dennis goddard was there and made a really great point look there's there's a regulated space there's a for people who want that kind of level of regulation there's the banking system and for those who trust it they can use it uh, but there are plenty of people who don't and who want to knowingly invest or use these programs without regulation, and that should be allowed. Excellent. Well, we'll keep we'll keep you to date with what's going on as far as cryptocurrency. And uh, when we did talk a little bit about the the Syria issue, I think war has such an impact on so many aspects of civil society that it, it's something we need to talk about, even if for an economic show. So it's very important that we. Propagate well, truth, more truthful news about what's going on. So well, that the fear mongering. Well, that's what all taxes, these so. banks. That's what all these banks fund. 
Yes. Right? We learn we talk about the central bank, central bank, central bank, and well, Switzerland's not so much into war, but the central banks in these warring nations are funding all this war uh, yeah. with taxes and other things. But it's crazy. Right. So be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Attic, and more. We are have a show every Wednesday. Uh, next week, of course, we'll have Roger Ver on, so there will probably be some bonus material. He's going to be on, hopefully, for a whole hour. But uh, tune in next Monday for that. Otherwise, this is JJ. This is Darren. And Randy. For Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.